Hello, welcome to Leading with Psychological Safety. My name is Michael Gillespie. I'm the presenter today, and I just uh, want to give you a little background about myself. I'm the founder of Blue EQ, which is a management consulting firm, um, an international consultant facilitator. My favorite title is entrepreneur. I've been successful starting multiple businesses, and I'm very proud of the fact that I graduated from Brigham Young University's MBA program. Just to give you some context, I want to share with you some of the clients that we've worked with over the last couple of years. And hopefully, as you look at these logos up here, you can identify either you work in that industry or maybe even work for some of these organizations. But I do this so that you can see the principles that I'm going to be sharing today, we've tested and proven across a lot of different industries and different organizations. And so, if you look at it, you see a lot of healthcare, pharma, government agencies, universities. And one of the ones that I'm proud of is uh, we have effectively trained all of the key leaders at the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta. These are the emergency responders that deal with uh, some of the very issues that we're, we're facing in our world today. I also want to give you some perspective of just how global uh, we've had the good fortune of being able to to be in our organization. And we've worked with leaders from over 75 countries and just last year alone, you know, I, I had the good fortune of working with uh, leaders from about 20 different countries. And so we bring an interesting perspective on this topic of leading with psychological safety. And so with that context, let me jump into the presentation. I want to talk about this uh, relationship and we call it the Blue EQ Core Logic. And this relationship around emotional intelligence, psychological safety, career and business impact, we believe that there's a cause and effect relationship between emotional intelligence, psychological safety, and career and business, and the, and the ability to create greater career and business impact. And as you increase one, it has an effect on the other. I want to start with psychological safety. Now, many people have heard of that term. It's becoming much more popular. We started, you know, our research around this field of, uh, of work in uh, about 2016. And since then, um, really, have probably been the organization that have trained the most leaders globally on psychological safety. And so here's what it is. It's a shared belief that it's safe to discuss ideas, experiment, take risks, give feedback, and learn from mistakes. It's safe to be vulnerable within the team. It's a culture of high trust. And it's a fact that every person, every organization creates a psychological zone around them. And so the question is, what kind of zone do you create as a leader? And in one end of the continuum, we like to call that a red zone, it's very unsafe. And on the other end of that psychological safety continuum, it's a blue zone. We call that a very safe zone. And I want to just take a moment and talk about each. In a red zone, red zone is about self-preservation, about risk management. Now, I'm talking about business risk. I'm talking about personal risk. It's about pain avoidance. In a red zone, you have low creativity because you can't make mistakes, you don't innovate. Uh, you have micromanagers, you have leaders that uh, tend to lean more on their position, their tenure and title. And uh, they are fear-based, they are driven, and frankly, in many cases, they can be successful in the short term. Well, what's the research on this? Well, the research that we like to use, and there's a lot of it, but Harvard University did a 12-year study. It was called the, the Price of Incivility in the Workplace. And here's just a summary of the study they did. And as you read through these, think about how this applies to even your organizations and your leadership style. But when you find somebody in a low psychologically safe environment, or they've had an interaction, a red zone interaction, if you will, 48% of these individuals intentionally decreased their work effort. 47% were found to intentionally decrease the time spent at work. 38% intentionally decreased the quality of their work. Well, what words stand out? Well, it's intentionally decreased. It's a decision they're making. 
Some of the other data, 78% said their commitment to the organization declined, and perhaps the most troubling is 25% admitted to taking out their frustrations on customers. Now, think about it in your career. You've probably worked in a red zone for a red leader at some point. I think we all have, the great micromanagers of the world. Well, let's contrast that with blue zone. Well, what is blue zone? Well, in a blue zone, you get career best contribution. You get discretionary effort, peak engagement. Now, when we talk about discretionary effort, that's not, that's not I work 10 hours a day and now I work 12 or 14. No, it's what we do at work. You know, because there's a minimal amount of effort that's required to get our job done in a, in a proper way. Discretionary effort is the effort that an employee, a team member, a leader brings to the organization that goes beyond the minimal amount required. What kind of behaviors do you get in a blue zone? Well, you get, you get openness. There's high trust. There's innovation, creativity, high engagement, high retention. People, once they find a blue zone, they never want to leave. Now, think about the best job, the best boss, the best leader that you've ever worked for. We've all had experiences in blue zones. Think about the, the type of work that was able to, to be accomplished in a blue zone. Because I'll tell you what, it takes energy and effort to maintain a red zone. And so think about that concept. So what's the research on this? Well, several years ago, Google recognized that in the 21st century, the work that's going to be accomplished is primarily going to be done in teams. So they commissioned, with the resources that they have, they commissioned a study called Project Aristotle, where they looked at 180 teams over two years, and they collected data on a lot of different factors, things like group dynamics, tenure, location, skill set, personality traits. You know, I kind of picture them putting all the introverts together, all the extroverts together, all the brainiacs together. And all together in, in one place and just studied their, their uh, productivity. How, uh, how, did the, how did they perform as a team? And after all this research and spending millions of dollars, here's what they found. The number one predictor of a high-performing team is the level of psychological safety on that team. Well, think about it as we define red zone and blue zone. In a blue zone, in a team with high psychological safety, Everybody feels safe to contribute. They, safe to be, they feel safe to take a risk, to be vulnerable, to, to make mistakes. Mistakes are encouraged so they can learn, quickly learn from those mistakes. It's an area of high engagement, high innovation, high trust, inclusion. You know, the other factors were clearly important, dependability, structure, clarity, meaning, and impact. But the number one predictor of successful teams is the level of psychological safety in that team. That's why we're hearing so much about this in the, in the research. Well, let me ask you this question. Let's bring it a little closer to home. In your organization, you as a leader, do you find that you're more red zone? Your organization's more red zone? Or are you blue zone? Is your organization blue zone? What's your opinion on this? As you contrast those two, think about it. I'll give you the, the research that we have and the studies that we've done. Informally, what we found is about 75% of organizations are more red than blue still. And why is that? Because business was created and, and uh, conducted years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, even 20 years ago, in a red manner. We had more micromanagers then. We, we had the ability to, to motivate more out of fear uh, back you know, years ago. And as we've evolved, we've looked at the rate at which business is changing and the way, right, the way that people like to work and engage with each other. And so there's this massive movement right now to go from a red zone organization to a blue zone organization. And what we find, in fact, the good news is it's happening quickly and it's happening globally. Why? Because when I teach leaders, I always ask, I teach them this concept and I ask, by show of hands, who wants to work in a red zone? Nobody ever raises their hands. Everybody wants to work in a blue zone, a, 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 an environment, a culture of high trust, of respect, of innovation, of inclusion, of collaboration. And so that's the direction that we're moving. And so the question, the organizations that will win as we move forward are the organizations that can be as blue as they possibly can be. It's going to be leaders that learn how to lead with psychological safety. Now, hear me on this. Blue zone is not about uh, avoiding uh, difficult issues. It's just the opposite. There's, high, there's more candor in the blue zone. There's more accountability. Why? Because... In the red zone, you have micromanagers that are trying to hold everybody and the team accountable. In a blue zone, you have individuals that are holding themselves accountable. Do people get fired 
in a blue zone, absolutely, they lose their employment for lack of performance, but they're not surprised. In a red zone, people don't know. And so when you look at accountability and candor and the way that we want to work in the workplace and inter interface and interact with each other, it's all about blue. Transparency is higher in blue. And so when you start really thin slicing these concepts, you'll see the power in leading with psychological safety. Well, let's take a look at this. You know, we talked about this cause and effect relationship. And I think it's pretty clear that, uh, you know, you'll get more performance in a blue zone than a red zone. You're going to have more retention and engagement. And frankly, you're going to have more career and business impact uh, in a blue zone versus a red zone. Well, we've talked about leading with psychological safety, but what's the driving factor of that. And that's really when we come to emotional intelligence. And so what is emotional intelligence? Emotional intelligence, I guess the textbook definition would be, is the ability to understand your, your own emotions and the emotions of others and use that knowledge to guide your thoughts and behavior, especially as a leader. Well, let me just, before I share with you some data, let me just give you the background on this. You know, we spent four years collecting this data from, again, from leaders from over 75 countries, Right now, we've had over 35,000 participants in our, in our research, and we're across all industries and even government. And we look at five emotional intelligence skills, and we contrast that with 25 emotional intelligence dimensions. We call those behaviors. And so if you look at this and take it in its full context, we're looking at over, you know, analyzing over 5.2 million specific points of data that we've collected in this uh, information I'm about to share with you. And so here's, here's how we break it down and how we look at and define emotional intelligence. And this is important to, to, to understand if we're really going to understand how to lead with, with greater levels of psychological safety. Well, at the skill level, you have uh, self-regard, self-awareness, self-control, social perception, and social effectiveness with really self-regard being the bridging skill between the self and the social. And so you'll see that we look at an overall score and that's the average of all the different data points that we're managing. And let me just pull this up and we've color coded it so you can see, you know, what, what the risk factors are, where the areas of success are and strengths. But if we take a deep dive at this and you, you look in the left-hand column there, self-regard, you know, at 80, 81%, and this data is a subset of our overall data. And we just, we were looking at leaders. So we're looking at about uh, 3,000 leaders in this subset globally. And so if you look at the, the behaviors that are associated with self-regard, with optimism, self-respect, self-confidence, motivation, and independence, that makes sense. Because you wouldn't be a leader and you wouldn't, you know, these folks that we work with wouldn't be where they're at if they didn't have some threshold level of self-regard. It just makes sense. But as you look at the other columns, I want to kind of point out, you know, social perception, social effectiveness. Social effectiveness is really our leadership column if there is such a thing. And it's our ability to influence and manage conflict and relationships and accountability and, you know, keep our own ego in check. But let me just share something with you. The areas that we struggle with globally as leaders is impulse control and stress tolerance and mindfulness. Across the board, it doesn't matter where we're at in the world, these are the three lowest uh, behaviors. And it makes sense. Look at the way that we work. Look at how we're connected and tethered to technology, which is creating stress for us. And we're, we don't take the time to be mindful. And it's, uh, it's, in, it's diminishing our ability to have influence, manage conflict, and build relationships with those with whom we lead. So the one thing I want to point out here is this is behavioral. You know, when you talk about leadership, we approach it from a behavioral perspective. And so, you know, it's measurable. You can look at it. You take an assessment like this, you don't get discouraged, you just start to fine tune those behaviors that you need to work on. And uh, everything that we measure can be changed. They're not fixed traits like personality. Personality tells us who we are. What we're talking about here with emotional intelligence as leaders, we're looking at who we can become. So this is just a, a snapshot, give you some insight in what's going on in this space globally. But I wanted to also share with you just a way, you know, it's important to us to measure this. And this is a study that we've done and we, we created a baseline and this was for an organization. And this is the organizational re results. And we're looking at it and we're saying this organization struggled with the very things that everybody struggles with around self-control, impulse control, stress tolerance. They struggled with openness. And uh, so we came in, we worked with them. We, we did some extra uh, training and consulting and put them on a path to develop out their plan, they became more self-aware. 
And what we found in 90 days when we reassessed is some amazing improvements that are happening in organizations when people focus on this. You know, their openness increased, their impulse control, their mindfulness, their ability to influence others. Probably one of the most desired attributes of a leader is my ability to influence others and get things done and then relationship management. So um, no longer is emotional intelligence and psychological safety this ethereal soft skill. It's something that can actually be measured. Let me just share with you another way that we look at this, and we've been doing this for about four years, and we've broken down psychological safety into really four key categories, and there's a whole body of research out this, uh, this and you know, some academics would say there's a, a four-step process or whatever. We find it to not be a linear relationship, but it's much more dynamic um, it, when you look at these types of behaviors, but we break it down into four quadrants, learner safety, collaborator safety, inclusion safety, and challenger safety. And so if you look at learner safety, we're talking about as a leader and ask yourself, do I create an environment where it's safe to discover, ask questions, experiment, learn from mistakes, look for more opportunities, learner safety is where innovation happens. If you look at challenger safety, do I create an environment where, you know, it's okay to speak up, to challenge the status quo, to express ideas, identify changes, expose problems. People will do that if they feel safe. They won't. They disengage if they don't. Do I create an environment where it's safe to collaborate, to engage in an unconstrained way, to have mutual access, to maintain an open dialogue, and then finally, inclusion safety? And again, there's no you know, one, two, three step formula to this. It's very dynamic. But as a leader, do I create an environment where people know that they are valued, where I treat people fairly, where I engage people and allow people to um, share their experience and ideas and, and they know that that matters? And it doesn't matter the title and position we allow everybody to openly contribute. When you have a culture, when you lead uh, an organization with this type of a style, you get amazing results. It literally, we've seen uh, leaders that can lead with psychological safety as a way to create literally a competitive advantage in the marketplace. Because we're all what? We're all looking for the best and brightest talent. And when people find a blue zone leader in a blue zone organization, they tend to stay. So in summary, you know, I want to go back to this core logic, this cause and effect relationship between emotional intelligence, psychological safety, and career and business impact. If you want to lead with more uh, psychological safety and have a, a blue zone environment and be a blue zone leader, it all starts with you. You can make a difference. And it all comes down to your emotional intelligence because we always say that your EQ is your delivery system of your IQ. Now think about that. You can be the smartest person in the room, and we've seen this over and over again, and I'm sure you have as well. You get people that are really smart, but they don't have the emotional intelligence to deliver that uh, brilliance and business acumen and experience that they have, and it literally diminishes their ability to lead. So I hope this has been helpful. I appreciate your time, and uh, certainly if you have any questions, you can find us at Blue EQ, uh, and we just, we just know the power uh, of leading with psychological safety. And this is something that you're going to hear a lot more about. Thank you very much.